ladies and gentlemen, wishing you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. For those who may not know me, I'm Phil Kedge, a retired police chief inspector, the director of the Mackenzie Friend UK Network and fearless family court vlogger. In all my vlogs, my views and opinions are, as always, entirely my own. Now, as my Christmas gift to you, I am offering you the opportunity of a one-to-one -one case review with myself on any aspect of your family court trial arrangements case for a 50% discount. All you have to do is to watch this on YouTube and to click the link in the description box below. Please hurry, because this offer ends on the 2nd of January. This Christmas and New Year's vlog is aimed mainly at all the non-resident parents out there who are mostly fathers. And I warn you in advance that this isn't going to be a happy, cheery, the world is wonderful Christmas vlog. Because I know that for many of you, I suspect thousands of you, your contact with your children this Christmas is being minimised, reduced, restricted or denied as a result of no more than spurious allegations of abuse and coercive control based on hate, hurt feelings, revenge, unfettered emotions and irrational anxieties displayed by the resident parent who are mostly mothers. My heart and thoughts go out to you. What can I say? You are not alone. I genuinely feel your, for your pain and your anguish. I speak to people in your position on most days and it's often some of the most difficult conversations that I have ever had. It seems incredible to me that, that the two most draconian powers that the state has against any citizen is firstly to put you in prison and secondly to remove your children from you. The irony, of course, is that trying to put people in prison who need to be in prison for the protection of the public is often next to impossible. But the state and family court judges seems to routinely rip children away from fathers for months on end with the willful abandonment of any common sense, good reason or merit. From what I see in about 60% of cases, this is based only on the vindictive, hysterical and false victimhood motivations of the resident parent. What is happening in courts up and down the country on a daily basis is truly shocking. That is why I have spent the last two years exposing how resident parents, the mostly mothers, are empowered and supported by the all too often sick in the head family lawyers to easily manipulate the courts to throw their ex under the family court bus, with devastating results on relationships and childhoods being destroyed. Sick family lawyers who have absolutely no duty of care to any child. How disgraceful is that? It makes my blood boil. I regularly see children systematically weaponised against fathers by resident parent mothers, often being whipped into hysterical frenzies by an entire relentless sisterhood network that thrives on man-hate, encourages conflict and holds this mad notion of the demasculation of men and that fathers, when relationships end, transform into toxic, coercively controlling narcissists and sociopaths. And of course, nothing can beat the nonsensical, totally unfit for purpose, Domestic Abuse Act of 2021, which is being routinely applied by idiot judges from Planet Stupid, with an absolute cretinous lack of any common sense or understanding of the real world. Rubber stamping, fact findings, during inadequate 45 minute direction hearings, denying contact and labelling fathers as domestic abusers and child abusers on nothing more than a total load of bollocks. Where slamming a door in anger, where raising your voice in argument, where walking in an 
angry manner, where calling your ex a name five years ago, where once throwing a soft toy across the room, where asking your ex why they are late home, when responding with an expletive when your teenage son farts on you, and where the normal and expected ups and downs of relationships, not always pretty, I know, are being institutionally determined by judges from Planet Stupid, and in some cases from Planet Moron, as domestic abuse, which is likely to have relevance in determining child contact. Unbelievable. It's no wonder that the family court is perhaps one of the most dangerous places for a father to enter on the planet. But here is the rub. If you apply the Domestic Abuse Act of 2021 without any modicum of common sense, then the strict definition is that pretty much any regrettable behaviour or incident within a relationship can be determined as domestic abuse. Under the definition, it's hard to imagine that there can be any relationship where there is not abuse involved as defined by the Act. And of course, that probably includes judges. How many of them may be domestic abusers and child abusers within their relationships? Oh, the hypocrisy of that. In the heat of the moment, your partner or spouse calls you a bastard and you call her a bitch. That's domestic abuse. And if it is said in the presence of the children, that's child abuse. I'm not condoning it, but on separation, perhaps many years later, the father is the one denied child contact and formally labelled by the broken, inept, incompetent and incomprehensible family court as a domestic abuser and child abuser. But when the resident parent mother engages in the same behaviour, it's absolutely fine that the child stays in their care. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one big Mad Hatter's tea party. So, what's the president of the family court? Mr Dressy Uppy himself, Sir Andrew McFarlane, doing about it? Well, from what I am seeing, absolutely nothing. Well, to be fair, after I exposed this insanity, he did send an urgent memo to all judges, which has clearly been widely ignored. Ladies and gentlemen, it appears to me that Sir Andrew's vision for reform of our family court is no more ambitious than what you may expect from a D-grade law student. You see, from what I can gather, he blames the 20% of cases where there are no allegations of abuse for clogging up his beloved court. And secondly, his mission is to change the institutionalised language to be less confrontational. For example, to change the terms applicant and respondent to something a little bit more friendly and less antagonistic which will apparently help all parents get on better and have a big love-in. I'm surprised he didn't suggest painting the walls of every family court pink and give parents lollipops to suck on to reduce tensions. When Sir Andrew came into power, he had that opportunity to lay out a vision for radical reform directly to us, the people, to be a great orator, to inspire us, to bring confidence that changes were afoot, that he was steering the ship in the right direction. So I have conducted extensive research to try and find his big epic moment in the spotlight. And what did I find? Well, it's only one speech, a keynote speech. Wait for it. Let's take a look. His keynote speech on Friday the 9th of November 2018 to the 24th Expert Witness Conference on Expert Witnesses. And how many views did that get? Well, 589. Now compare that to my vlogs that get over 5,000 views a month. That's a large chunk of Family Court Service users listening to me and not him. 
that appears to be his biggest moment, and no one is even interested in what he had to say. So, since then, has he reached out to us, the people, the service users? Has he engaged with us about the broken family court? Well, the only other thing I could personally find was a Radio 4 interview on Radio 4 Broadcasting House in July this year. A radio programme that of course we all regularly tune into and where the main thrust of his interview from my personal interpretation is that we, the family court service users, are the stupid people being unable to resolve things ourselves and clogging up his family court. Now let's balance this out in the spirit of fairness. I have no doubt that Sir Andrew McFarlane is an honourable man, a very clever man, and his heart is in the right place. And he's been knighted, a knighthood, that's brilliant. And we can have full confidence that the establishment doesn't give those away to any old Tom, Dick or Andrew, do they? Now, I even know that he's a nice man because I recently saw a tweet by a law student who took a selfie with Sir Andrew with the caption saying, me with the nicest man in family law. But there lies a problem. He may be a very nice man, but in my opinion, he certainly isn't a leader. I believe that he feels safe under his wig and dressing gown, hiding behind the iron curtain of the family court, but simply terrified when it comes to communicating, in reaching out, in knowing how to, in driving through radical ideas and change. And being referred to as the nicest man in family law, I think that sums it up. Because as a leader, the one thing you never want to be called is nice. Call me anything but nice. It's a kiss of death. If you think about the egos of judges and the legal establishment, being nice isn't going to get you very far. Ladies and gentlemen, is his time up? Can we endure another two years of ineffective, invisible leadership as children are suffering immeasurably with relationships and childhoods being destroyed. And when the change at the top does come, is it time to remove lawyers from being appointed as the head of the family court with that astonishing £230,000 per year pay packet? We need a leader in that position, a person who represents us the people, to get a grip on our family court, to bring about real and fundamental changes from the top all the way down to the grassroots, and to achieve that through determined, forceful leadership. So where does all this leave us? Well, without leadership and meaningful change, it's down to us to appropriately take a stand, because the stark choice for the mostly fathers is that you either take a stand or continue to get thrown under the family court bus one after another after another. And I am clear on this, however uncomfortable it may be to hear. As fathers, we have to wake up from our naivety and to start empowering ourselves and to work together. Just think of the endless support services, societies, charities, help groups out there for women, many of them now pandering to the woke, false victimhood culture that has taken over major parts of our society, propagating hate, acrimony and division. And from what I see, nowhere is it thriving more than when it comes to separation, child arrangements and the manipulation of the family court. Every week, fathers contact me expressing that they are getting blindsided and systematically crushed by the family court, being hit by a tsunami of hate before they even understand what's happening to them. 
and by the time they do, it's of course too late. The other day, one father described the family court as being like a boa constrictor, taking hold of him, crushing the life out of him with no escape. A very fair analogy in my books. We, as fathers, have to change and adapt. Let me give you this mildly stereotypical anecdote. When going through separation, when mothers go out, they may often meet their sisterhood to talk about experiences, tactics, and how to throw their ex under the family court bus. It becomes a combined mission to protect her children against the narcissist ex who ruined the fairy princess dream and put them back on the shelf as a single parent. Revenge is going to be sweet. When fathers go out to meet the brotherhood, it's to have a few beers in order to forget about the anxieties, stresses and madness of the family court. The last thing they want to do is to talk about it. And that's the start of the problem. Fathers usually exist in isolation, clueless, disempowered and without support. So what do they do? They go running to the sick in the head family lawyers, who certainly achieve significant success in transferring as much money as possible from the bank of dad into theirs routinely fleecing fathers out of tens of thousands of pounds. We have to end this cycle of fathers being isolated and then fleeced, often to the point of crippling lifelong debt. Fathers perhaps need to learn from the mothers and to start mirroring what they do. That would be interesting. So, what about me? Well, this is my commitment to you for 2023. I am going to continue to fearlessly raise these issues and through my vlogs to explore all of the options for fathers on how to appropriately take a stand against spurious allegations of hate in a way that has never been done before. So, I will see you on the other side of this festive Christmas holiday. And my advice to you is whatever your family court situation is to rest, regain your strength, start building a network of support and perhaps even think about booking that case review with myself via the link below. Until I see you again, Merry Christmas, stay strong and remember you are not alone.